Hi, and welcome to uh, this panel on uh, gamers with disabilities. Uh, this is for Diversity Plus. Diversity Plus is the part of Indie Plus that will be exploring the issues that minority gamers face in a meaningful way by showcasing upcoming designers, discussing subjects in depth, and having a lot of fun playing games. Tonight we'll be discussing some of the basic issues that gamers with disabilities may face. Please note that this event upholds the Indie Plus community standards. To find out more about the standards, head to our website at IndiePlus.org. I will be your moderator tonight. I am Sarah Richardson. You may have seen me playing a destructive, yet loving, barbarian named Shashina in the Indie Plus series Chain World. I illustrate, layout, and design tabletop RPGs. And with me tonight are some very lovely people. Uh, Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Beth Rimmels. I am a writer, editor, social media marketing manager, and I have been playing tabletop games, well, RPG specifically, for, I embarrassed to admit, 30 years. Um, I'm also a game designer and uh, run games, demo games for other companies and things like that. Um, so, yeah, kind of all over the place with it. <laughs> <laughs> That was very awesome, and, and I have to say that uh, Beth is definitely one of the best social media people I know, so mm -hmm. whenever she talks about it, you should definitely listen. Uh, next up, cool. you're welcome. Next up, uh, we have Elsa. Um, I'm Elsa Shemison Henry. I am a game designer, uh, accessibility manager, and um, a sort of media critiquer. Um, I've been gaming since I was seven or so. Uh, you can kind of hear about what happened during my first ever game of Dungeons and Dragons in Dragon Plus magazine this month in February. Uh, and um, I'm half blind and half deaf and I occasionally can be spotted in a wheelchair at cons because chronic pain is exciting. <laughs> Uh, yes, and we will be uh, posting links to a bunch of stuff, uh, including that wonderful article that Elsa just wrote. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we do have Jacob. Hi, um, I'm Jacob Wood. I'm the owner of uh, Accessible Games and the marketing manager for Third Eye Games. I do a lot of writing, game design, and uh, print layout um, as a uh, both self-published author and uh, freelance author. Um, I'm visually impaired, and I have been gaming since uh, about 20 years ago, um, and have been loving it ever since. Uh, that That is great, and I guess I should mention that I know uh, Jacob through uh, an organization that we're both in, and that Elsa's in as well, uh, called the IGDN. Mm -hmm. um, so my experience with Jacob, uh, although has primarily been through that professional relationship has also been pretty amazing, which is why we have these people here today. So before we get really into the uh, disability issues, you all mentioned how long you've been gaming, but Jacob, how did you get into gaming? Um, I got into gaming like just about any other 12-year-old boy in the 90s, I think. Um, I... Uh, my best friend's older brother had a game of RuneQuest that he was really dying to run, and he ran it for me and my friends, and um, we kind of never looked back. Um, we just kind of latched onto it. We started designing our own tabletop games um, just in notebooks and notebooks of paper and binders and playing them together, and um, just really fostered my love for that design, which I didn't do anything with for another decade or more. Um, but then, you know, eventually things come together and you start making it a profession to justify all of the hours that you spent in your life doing it <laughs> as a hobby. I really, I really like that. <laughs> uh, Elsa, how about you? So, um, I, you know, it's funny, I can't remember when we, when we first started, but I started playing Magic the Gathering when I was six or seven years old. Um, because my best friends at the time were playing it, and so I wanted to play too. 
Uh, we had to modify my cards a little bit, but I tended to play that. And then when I was 12, I got introduced to Dungeons and Dragons at camp. And from there, it was a swift flight into me wanting to play all of the games. Um, and then after I finished my master's in women's history, I kind of fell sideways writing role-playing games. Uh, that is interesting experience. Hmm. Okay. So, so two very different experiences so far. How about you, Beth? Well, I was basically raised to be a geek. Um, I was raised on science fiction, fantasy, all of that. And also gaming, but initially it was board games and card games, you know, fairly standard for most people. And then it was friends introduced me to, again, Dungeons and Dragons. It seems to be the entry game. Um, and I've always been a storyteller, so the fact that I was interactive storytelling and collaborative storytelling, and I also have a minor in theater, so the whole acting portion really appealed to me. And um, I got introduced to it and never looked back, and within a year of playing, I was creating my own campaign world, and yeah, you can't stop me. <laughs> I'll be doing this until I die. <laughs> that I also have a, I majored in theater in college, and that probably didn't help. <laughs> That that is beyond high school, but yeah, I've I've heard some some similar stories. So it's interesting that all three of you kind of started with more traditional uh, games. So between RuneQuest and D and D, even Magic: The Gathering. So all of these games, and I love these games. Do not get me wrong. They don't really address how to play somebody who say has low vision or is in a wheelchair. Like, that is not an option whenever you're making your character. Um, so, what would you... Whenever you were making your characters, did that bother you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, to elaborate on that, um, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> when that, that's what I was expecting you to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Kids, like you want to play yourself. That's a that's a large part of sort of imaginative play is going out and being a fantastic. And um, I remember, yeah, I I feel like I'm repeating some of the article that I wrote, but uh, that's okay. I remember the first game of D&D I played, I created a half-blank rogue, and she pulled out a bow and arrow. No, she was a ranger. She wasn't a rogue. But she uh, pulls out a bow and arrow to shoot at a dragon, and my my campmate says, but you can't shoot at it. You're terrible at archery. I was very upset that a blind person was saying that they could shoot really well because that was outside of the realm of mm -hmm. for him. And so I remember that that actually was a really big impression for me of things I didn't want in my imaginative games. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. ever after that, I would kind of tweak the games that I ran or when I ran them to make sure that it was a little bit more inclusive. I've actually had um, kind of very different experience than Elsa. Um, I only started really to lose my vision when I was about 16, so when I started gaming, it wasn't even in the back of my mind. Um, but that's not to say that over the years it hasn't become more and more of a concern for me. And I remember one of my first Pathfinder characters was um, of the Oracle class, and they have these, they call them curses, and this never really stood out to me at the time. This is something that um, we may come back to later, but um, some of the curses are things like low vision, um, poor hearing, being um, having low mobility. And I, I picked a character who had low vision. I could only see out to about 30 feet, and I used my 10-foot pole as my cane in the game. And it actually wound up working out really well for me in that circumstance because there was a trap as it happened that was on the ground that I managed to trigger with this 10-foot pole that I was using as my cane in-game. 
Um, so I had a, a fun experience with others at the table who could kind of um, recognize that I was using something both as an aid and as a um, as a tool. And that I think kind of opened people's eyes to the fact that just because you have a visual impairment doesn't mean that you can't be a useful contributor to society or to the game or to whatever it is that's happening. I came at this a little bit differently because my eye issues didn't begin until about a year and a half ago. Um, it's been a series of retinal surgeries and uh, technically I'm classified as a temporary disability. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be the case. It all depends upon how it heals. Um, but um, from the earliest time role playing, and I think part of this is because I got into Champions, Champions actually has options to make characters that, um, you know, blind, deaf, partial, not, whatever. And of course, because it's a superhero game, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're not capable. So, you know, for example, think of Professor X and the X-Men. He's in a wheelchair. He's one of the strongest mutants in the world. Um, so, it... I did necessarily, even though it wasn't my issue of trying to find someone who matched me at the time, I've always had this tendency of making characters and including NPCs that fit the spectrum of life. And when I was an entertainment journalist, one of my complaints was, you know, well, why can't the chairman of the board in this thing be in a wheelchair or be this or be that? Because that's life. Um, and of course, now for real, I'm living it. So, but that's why I'm coming at it a little bit differently. But um, it's, it's always, I've always tried to include the full spectrum of people and backgrounds in my games and in my stories. So it's that, that feeling of we need to see ourselves in the games. Yeah. Um, that is kind of a universal cry among all the underrepresented groups. Um, so... I really, really liked your stories, and I, I do know that uh, superhero stories in particular can be kind of like sometimes okay, sometimes problematic on how they approach people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have so no wrong feelings about Daredevil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm taking notes while we're talking, and I already put Daredevil in the notes. So if you would like to <laughs> take take a few minutes to talk about Daredevil, I think it still is totally okay, because I can see someone making a character based on Daredevil and maybe not understanding why that might... Some people might not be okay. <laughs> so my issue with Daredevil... Is that I feel like the the way that it's written in the comics has perpetuated this concept that Daredevil isn't really blind, mm -hmm. and that's a real issue for me because I want Daredevil to be actually blind and still awesome, and so it undercuts the idea of disability representation when a superpower basically makes it so that that disability is null and void. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, a particular issue with the Daredevil TV show is that he broke my cane away every time he <laughs> And I sat down and I did the calculations, and if I'm right about the length of time that place, he spent around $800 in white cane, which we all know he doesn't have the money for. <laughs> to know what she was setting off when she brought this up. <laughs> I did, I did, and I was enjoying it. Um, <laughs> did you want to want to add to that, Jacob? Or that pretty much sums up my feelings. Although I hadn't done that math. <laughs> <laughs> really the math just makes it better. <laughs> um. All right. Trying to to get back on track here, even though like comic books and superheroes. Um. So, you guys were looking for a way to play uh, more representative characters, whether it, it suited you at the time or not. Um, what would you say some game designers could do to be more inclusive of diversity in their games? And I know that's like a super broad question, so feel free to address as much or as little as you want. And... Uh, Anybody in particular want to go first? 
Um, so one of the things that I think publishers and designers can do is to make the options overtly available um, because a lot of the arguments that I've seen have been, well, there's nothing stopping you, but there's nothing really giving us the okay either. Right. Um, and also to to make these tools not seem like just a minus two penalty to ranged attacks when you have a visual impairment. You know, Savage Worlds, as much as I love the system and the game, has these hindrances that are just like, you have one eye, so you take a minus four penalty to ranged attacks. That's that's what you get. And there's nothing really um, addressing these sorts of issues. Um, and it's just like, like I was going, speaking earlier about the, the curses from Pathfinder, they're always seen as drawbacks, hindrances, faults, or what, whatever you want to call it. But it's not seen as a role-playing option. It's just seen as a penalty that you can use to offset getting more points to play with mm -hmm. another power that you can potentially use to erase your disability. Mm -hmm. That was always my issue in World of Dark character creation, was that disabilities were flaws. First of all, mm -hmm. that they were referred to as flaws really bothered me. But second of all, the point-based system where you got more stuff for taking the disability. And part of what bothers me about that is also that it becomes a um, one size which I see is an issue because it perpetuates um, some of the larger societal perceptions of disability. Like, blindness, if it's a five-point flaw, means that you're totally blind. There's no... Whereas, all people on the panel have a visual impairment and you're only... So, that's a really good illustration of how different one single disability you're uh, cutting out a little bit at the end of your sentences. Oh, okay. That's so sorry. Annoying. Uh, so a as That's I understood it, you were talking about how in World of Darkness, by having blindness as a five-point flaw, it only represents one level of, of uh, lack of vision. Mm -hmm. I probably summarized that badly. <laughs> well, it's sort of like because of the way that those merit or flaw-based point systems work, it reinforces that a disability is a one-size-fits-all issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, for a really good example here, you have three people with visual impairments on this panel, and we all have different representations of that single disability. Mm -hmm. There's and a broad spectrum. Exactly. And there's a broad spectrum of physical disabilities, of invisible disabilities, that the disability isn't a one-size-fits-all experience, and so that's why I tend to shy away from points-based systems, and I encourage designers to do the same. Yeah, the uh, Champions technically uses a point-based system, because I, I, I used that as an example earlier, and un what do they call them now? I forget in the newest edition, they changed what used to be disadvantages. So again, unfortunately, it's still using that same negative terminology, um, but again, thankfully, because it's a superhero game, if you're thoughtful, and the main thing in the game, the disadvantages are supposed to be um, role play and story opportunities. So players and GMs can think of it that way without necessarily being considered a bad thing, but I'm not sure necessarily because the term for so long was disadvantages came across that way. But when I was in college, a friend of mine made a superhero character who was a blind teleporter. And, you know, he didn't have any powers that offset the blindness, as you're saying with Daredevil. But it was a really cool character, and he could teleport, and he had all these other cool powers. Um, so it can be handled well, but a lot of times it's just not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's see. So now that we we've kind of discussed like some of the bad ways to do it, do you have can you think of any games that do a good job of including people with disabilities? And feel free to like fan girl boy all over your favorite games if there is one that you particularly love. 
Um, but yeah, what what's some some good games that people can play to ki that have a better representation in them? Oh, I think silence is very telling. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was about to do that exactly. Are we allowed to talk about sure. our own? You can, in fact, talk about your own games because if. If there are games out there that aren't meeting your needs, and that's one reason you're making your own games, totally fair. This, this is, in fact, the case. All right, tell um, us all about Dead Scare. Yeah, so in Dead Scare, <laughs> it is entirely possible to play a fully uh, disabled character with full-blown weapons. In There's an entire section dedicated to how to play a character with a disability in the 1950s apocalypse. Um, I think it's pretty great. I've been told by players that it's pretty great, and I hope people play it. Uh, <laughs> and also use those things, because, yes, play more disabled characters than zombies, please. <laughs> <laughs> and to that end, I'm actually currently working on a project called Survival of the Able, and it puts you... Um, as a character with a disability in medieval Europe in 1347, which uh, is the Black Plague era. Um, and it's specifically designed to give people an experience of playing a character who has a disability in a situation where modern technology can't be there to assist. And we don't have things like the Americans with Disabilities Act to... Um, to kind of use a, an idea for what makes things accessible or what doesn't. It's a very uninviting world for people who had disabilities back in that time period. Oh, yeah. And I kind of wanted to <clears throat> stress that and put people into uncomfortable situations where they will be forced to address it in ways that um, the system will hopefully kind of like encourage you to interact with. So it's definitely not a point-based system. It does use um, kind of a modified version of Fudge or Fate. And um, I've removed any uh, references to things like gifts and faults, which is something that Fudge uses as terminology, and kind of replace them with other, other features. And disabilities aren't gifts or faults. They are just part of your character and part of who you are. Mm -hmm. We have different... Um, levels of um, senses, so you can like see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Those are all game attributes, mm -hmm. and they come in different um, different trait levels because people have different levels of those abilities, those senses. So, um, hopefully, by the time that's released, we'll have a game to go with Dead Scare that will show people what it's like to be able to play a character with a disability and not have um, the stigma and the baggage of a lot of the games that have come before. That is really exciting. And I didn't know you were working on that. I'm I, I've only just recently announced this game, like, last week. So. Oh, okay. And I come give one Jacob an email. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> what were you going to say, Ben? I was going to say, in my case, my game is uh, still in the process of being designed, and um, it's Awesome 8's um, it's a role-playing game, and the purpose of the game is to be very rules light to both facilitate character-driven and story-driven role-play, and also to be very newcomer-friendly, um, which actually this past weekend at Dreamation I had more, um, you know, proof of that that works. Um, but so mechanically, basically the way my game is working at the moment, and things could still change, but mechanically is a point buy, but you're buying skills and knowledge. Um, you're not necessarily buying anything that has to do with physical. And what I'm thinking of how to handle it is actually to make it more of the role-playing suggestion portion of the book and, you know, the section on how to make a character and think about a character would be more to say, you know, again, think about diversity and you know, you don't have to be just, you know, a very limited thing. Because um, I'm sorry, you know, I loved uh, Batgirl when she became Oracle. 
Um, she never yeah. stopped being a superhero. She just changed how she was a superhero. You know, and and I want to expand how people think about things and to be able to do something like that. That girl is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that girl is pretty great. <laughs> um, I also yeah, and have. I also do have to mention the, the Fate Accessibility Toolkit, which I'm currently working on for Evil Hat. And um, I'm super excited about it because it's going to basically talk about all kinds of disabilities and how to play them within the system. Um, I'm hoping that that will be a really good way to get all kinds of games to a better standard of disability access. Yes. So, would you say that's more a, a toolkit for the player or for the designer or both? Both. Cool. Because I'm hoping that people designing Fate Hacks going forward will use some of the tools that are in that book to turn around and say, I can make this different. Mm -hmm. mm. So, one thing that I'm noticing that you're all talking about is just the importance of language. Like, I mean, I cringed a little whenever you related the curses in Pathfinder, Jacob. Uh, so I, I can't imagine how that made you feel. Um, so the idea of gifts or uh, the dis or uh, what did they call them in flaws in World of Darkness. Uh, so I, you know, I definitely understand that language is very important. Uh, whenever you're looking at games, I'm assuming does the language kind of influence a little bit how you think of it in terms of, of these issues? That is the awkwardest question ever. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and if you'd like I'm, me to condense it, please say so. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I think I understand what you're saying. So the way I have sort of viewed these games over the last several years is um, just kind of a sad shake of my head. You know, I don't necessarily fault a game for um, falling into that trope because they've just been following in the footsteps before them and, you know, going back and back and back years and years and years to systems like World of Darkness that use flaws. GURPS, Shadowrun, you know, all of these different systems have made the same mistake, and I'm hoping that we can shift that part of the industry. But um, personally, I, I won't not play a game just because it includes those things, but I do prefer to, um, to start that discussion with people and to definitely let them know, like, why it's offensive and why we need to change our perception of... Um, and the language that we use around games, for sure. You did understand and my like, garbled question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I also think it's important to kind of look at it outside of the language inside of games to the language we use within the community. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very important. Because uh, there are two sort of ways that people uh, with the, with disabilities identify, and there's either person-first language or identity-first language. And I think ado adopting into the vernacular of sort of what we say at a games table, if we're, if we're finding that we have people with disabilities playing with us, is to find out whether people want to be identified as identity-first or person-first. I prefer identity-first. But I use person-first language because there are a lot of people who don't. If that is making sense outside of my brain. <laughs> it Can you is. give examples? Yes. So um, person-first language is very simple. It is putting the word person before you say disabilities. So mm -hmm. person with a disability or person with blindness or person with hearing issues, etc. Um, I prefer to be a blind woman or a disabled woman. I feel like the identity of disability is very much intertwined with who I am. I haven't known any existence outside of disability. So for me, I don't feel the need to, to take them apart. But I understand that other people do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to kind of respect that uh, distinction. 
I agree. I um, I advocate for person first language, and in fact, I had um, several months ago linked to a, an article from the Associated Press about their guidelines for talking about people with disabilities and how it was very um, person first. Um, personally, it doesn't bother me one way or the other whether you call me a blind person or a person with blindness or a person with a disability, but that's just because I have over the years kind of come to identify with that myself, and I've got kind of a thick skin. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people, and especially I think to bring this topic to like a wider audience, we need to get rid of the... Um, the stigma associated with being a quote-unquote blind person because that that same sort of language is used to call people deaf dumb or yeah. um, all of the horrendous language that we used to use for, to talk about people with disabilities especially with mental illnesses yeah. um, dating back centuries decades you know um, so even in recent years, we have not gotten rid of those offensive parts of the language that we need to get rid of. So starting with person first is the way to to reel back against that language and to get to get that out of our vocabulary before we can start talking about using a more of a um, what did you call it, Elsa? Uh, ident identity. Identity first. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think identity, no. first, I use it when I'm talking about myself, but I don't use it when I'm talking about other people. Because right. I want to make sure that I'm not somehow hurting someone else. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's important what you're saying, Jacob, about sort of how we have to shift the language, because it's also the way that we use certain words. Um, I always cringe when people say something like, someone is blind to the truth, for example, mm -hmm. because Blindness should not be a synonym for ignorance. And it really frustrates me when people use it that way. Uh, did you have something you wanted to add, Beth? I, this is going a little bit beyond the scope of this, but I also think, I mean, obviously we can only do what we can do as game designers. But I also, because I have been an entertainment journalist, I always tend to look at in the broader pop culture perspective and I think we would be gain a little bit more sensitivity in the gaming field if it was also represented in other parts of entertainment Absolutely. and it's not mm -hmm. you know because I mean that's the thing is people keep, like for example fantasy um, role-playing games are so the default in the industry but yet the average person can't even conceive of well, how would you make this work if someone had a disability in a fantasy campaign? <laughs> um, except for a very few limited examples. I think that's yeah. why I love the superhero genre, because it is more flexible towards that. But, damn it, we just need to write the stories. Yeah, I mean, I have to tell you, after the Dragon Plus article came out on Thursday, my Twitter feed was, for at least 24 hours, just lost to people tweeting at me, but how do I make a blind archer? But how do I make a paralyzed orc? I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that actually helps because um, I, I know it wasn't in our prepared questions, but it, it it does seem to be coming up. So, what what do you say to the people who are like, this is not realistic for me to include this in my fantasy, or why would I do this, even? Um, I mean, that, that kind of speaks to the representation, but obviously the, the pushback, the discomfort that people feel seems to come from, how do I put this in my game? In the how 19, do I play this? In the 1990s, when I was pitching some ideas for the newspaper that I worked at about pop culture and things like that, and one of the things that I railed about was the fact that there wasn't enough representation of this in Hollywood, not that the newspaper, of course, could fix this, but that would be something we should be commenting on. And as I said earlier, if you're doing, you know, some sort of story, the chairman of the board, the, the king, the whoever, you know, like I said, they can be in a wheelchair, you know, or they could be deaf, or they could be whatever. You just have to 
look at the world that's around you and reflect that in your stories and it makes the fantasy more believable and it also stretches your imagination to think about well how would you make this work I mean come on Rucker Hauer played a blind uh, martial artist in um, I'm blanking on the name of the movie um, but you know, there's always this, it can happen I'm sorry what was that Elsa? There's always Zatoichi <laughs> How can we not discuss Zatoichi? Like, really? Uh, no, I, and like, it's hard for me to even ask the question because obviously I don't feel this way. Um, but Elsa or Jacob, did you have any reaction to whenever people push back against the idea of of including uh, people with disabilities in games? I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, do you have anything to add about uh, like the pushback you're getting for your article of, of how do I include this in my game? Well, I mean, I think a lot of what my issue with the pushback has been is that I feel like there's ways to go and do the research without going forward. Does that make sense? Like, I think that it's important for people not just to say to disabled gamers, teach me how to play who you are. But I think it's also important to say, go and seek out stuff like Zatoichi or, um, oh, what's that movie? Uh, the Marco Polo series on Netflix has a blind martial artist. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Western myth doesn't actually have as much disability to the front and center that I think some Asian um, television does. I'm not in uh, movies, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. But I've noticed that there are more blind martial artists than there are, say, good knights with disabilities. Uh -huh. That's um, a good point, yeah. Yeah, and so I think that's really what I like to say to people when they ask me those questions, is not to necessarily give me answers, but to encourage them to look at characters like Oracle, Professor X, or Rogue, or Deadpool, who I read as a disability narrative. So... Mm -hmm. I think it's important to do their research. Yes, definitely. People need to do their own research, too. Yeah. How about you, Jacob? Um, yeah, it's definitely out there. Uh, one of the ideas um, or the examples that came to my mind was Kenji from the Mortal Kombat series. He's yet another blind martial artist. Yep. Um, <laughs> I, I think but, it now qualifies as a trope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think that actually... <laughs> More to the notion that there's this mysticism surrounding blind martial artists, right? That blind people um, have the daredevil senses and they can see the world around them without their eyes. And I think that's more of a stereotype than necessarily um, an accurate representation. And so... I'm not really sure always where to point people because not all of the representation that's out there is positive. Right. Um, like my favorite representation to point to would be Toph from Airbender. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one myself. Is it? She has um, she has a superpower ability that's called Earthbending, and she can actually bend the world to her feet. So her. Yeah. Her superpower is an adaptive device. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So I, I feel like we may have some work to do still to show people how they can play with as characters with disabilities, um, even using their favorite games that aren't necessarily designed for it. Um, it might be an interesting project to create some NPCs who showcase what that would look like in their favorite systems because obviously a lot of people have these questions and whether or not they're asking them in earnest is hard to say. But for those who are, um, I don't feel like it would be a bad thing to try to help show them. I don't disagree. I guess it's just I, I want to uh, know that I'm spending the time that I have on people who really want the questions answered. Yes, exactly. Because, like I was mentioning, not everybody is necessarily asking that question in earnest. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's I feel like probably the same issue that we've been having in a lot of other discussions in the gaming industry about representation of women or LGBT or people of color. It's um, a lot of different marginalized people out there and the kind of straight white male majority has been really pushing back against all of it. And, um, you know, it's time that we just all kind of step up and show examples of why and how it can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're, you're both speaking to the idea of both that uh, some people do want to be educated, awesome, and then the fact that asking the people who need this done to do the work of educating is also a, a burden. It it takes up their time and and all and energy. Um, however, I love the idea of doing example NPCs, and I hope mm -hmm. that idea takes off and everyone does it and they give you credit, Jacob, because I love that. Yeah, idea. somebody go do it because I sure <laughs> don't have the time right now. <laughs> Now, now I know what one of my Illuminating Spaces articles should be. Yep. Yes. Yep. That that I I realize I am guilty of not doing that, and I will fix that. Uh, so to bring it, it the conversation back down a little bit to a more manageable chunk, as your moderator's <laughs> brain is starting to to get fuzzy from her cold. Um. So what exactly? What precisely? could game designers do to make their playtest materials more accessible? And this might also include not just playtests, but like published games. Do you have any advice for game designers and what they can do to make it easier for you to play their games? Um, I have... Oh, lots of nodding, okay. Literally <laughs> books dedicated to this. Um, check out the Accessible Guide to RPG Layout on DriveThruRPG. Um, it's also a completely free series on my blog. It's called Tutorial Tuesdays. Um, I go into depth about how to make um, PDFs that are accessible to screen reader technology and screen magnifiers. Um, that's, in my opinion, the, the best start to creating accessible RPGs is to create an RPG that everybody can access. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. And then after that, um, we can consider game mechanics that are a little bit more accepting than, say, a 10d10 dice pool that has exploding dice that you have to roll and count and keep track of and re-roll, and it's, so, you know, those sorts of game mechanics. I have visual tricky. aid for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wasn't expecting props, so I'm now excited. <laughs> That's right. I saw you yes. post a picture of that. It's really big. Do you, do you like it though? Um, I don't use it all that often because it's not that well balanced. Mm. Um, See, now we're getting geeky. We we're showing dice. Yeah, this is my deep level, <laughs> my large print one. So a dice pool of one of these would be sticking them all into a very large cup and then rolling them on their own separate surface. <laughs> um, I guess my my big tip for people would be to look at your character sheets because uh, a lot of character sheets tend to have a lot of stuff on them and the more stuff that you put on a character sheet, the smaller your type has to be and therefore the less accessible it is to someone with low vision like I have. Um, so I encourage people to make their, their character sheets as sort of open and easily functional not easily functional, that's a terrible turn of phrase, uh, both readable and easily used as possible. And when, and when you're talking character or, um, character sheets and certain other things in the books, um, just good graphic design. And the thing is, graphic design, yes, we want everything to be pretty, but there are differences in, in fonts and things oh, that can yes. change totally <laughs> how readable something is. Oh, yes. Um, no parts and then I, I totally <laughs> want Echo... <laughs> oh, Sorry, that, I well, interrupt. And, and I also want Echo completely what, what Jacob said about making the PDFs readable. Um, as I Because it's been, like I said, a year and a half of surgeries and, and all sorts of things with my eye and and I won't know for at least two more years what my recovery will be. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a gamer, so I have continued to run games to the best of my ability. And even when I can get a PDF sometimes, I've had PDFs where the columns were 
organized completely backwards. So mm-hmm. it completely messed up a screen reader. Mm-hmm. And, you know, or again, because of the background, the, the printer friendly version, which should be easier for the screen reader, wasn't. And D&D like basic that. set, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call that one out yeah, right I, now because Wizards does not have an excuse. I was, I, I was trying to be discreet, but yes, the <laughs> documentation for encounters. Uh, well, now it's Adventurers League. But yeah, all the columns were backwards. So if I ran it through a screen reader to prep for my game, because actual running I can do with my condition because a lot of it's just talking. Um, and, you know, the role play and all, and I can handle the dice. I've got high contrast dice. But when I'm doing the prep material, that was what was wrecking me because it's reading the right column before the left column and things like that, and what? And there's, and like you say, there's no reason for that. You know, the other one is, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for this because I know people like their pretty, pretty fonts, but I feel like you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Handwriting fonts. Oh, you are talking about me. I love you. Uh, it's okay. Fonts are really, really frustrating. I mean, it depends on which one. But super loopy handwriting fonts can be very difficult to tell the difference between letters. And that can make some words look super ridiculous and some words just not make any sense. So I encourage people to find either super readable handwriting fonts or to find a better way to express that particular aesthetic. No, I totally agree with you. And and <laughs> thus was a little bit of teasing on my behalf. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, well, I and, make... and I don't... Yeah. Oh, I was going to oh, say, I don't ahead. know if the... Sorry. I was going to say, I don't know if the technology's there, but if not, you know, maybe we need to find a, a geek to make it so. Um, but to make it that, you know, if something shows in a pretty font, but you run it through a screen reader that maybe somehow it switches over to, I don't know. I mean, it, what, at the very minimum, if you're going to do the pretty but hard to read design, make equally accessible the easily read version for people. You know, make it two for somehow that's the very simple. Um, tech, I just keep feeling that technology-wise there should be a way to translate the pretty stuff into what we need for accessibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how. I'm not a coder, but... Uh, what I can do is I'll make sure to include uh, at, in the description of this event, uh, since I am a graphic designer, I, uh, there are some, I know there's a bunch of articles recently that have talked about uh, designing fonts specifically for their readability mm-hmm. uh, and what fonts are better for that than others. So, I, Because oh, this fantastic. is something I'm guilty of. I will make sure to include those links. <laughs> it's, and you know, Sarah, it's something I struggle with too as a layout artist because yeah. um, I want to find nice fonts and typefaces, but sometimes it's difficult to find some that match the aesthetic that you're looking for that are readable. So I definitely feel you there. But we can, like Beth was saying, um, create dual layouts even with PDF layers are an amazing thing that I advocate yes, for regularly. And it was it would not be difficult to create a toggleable layer that is um, more accessible. You know, some people <clears throat> can't get rid of their parchment backgrounds, but if you just can't let go of that, then at least put it on a background layer and let me turn it off. <laughs> oh, hallelujah, yes. <laughs> and, and, by way, and by the way, some of this benefit other people because there's a game company I'm not going to mention because... Um, but their PDFs had something like 20 layers in them just because of sloppy graphic design. And mm. so opening one on a tablet was a nightmare, um, mm-hmm. let alone the readability because of the layers that you could see, which was making it impossible to read. Right. Um, and also, too, I know people who do not have any vision issues who use PDF readers because mm-hmm. it's convenient for them while they're commuting. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so some of the stuff that makes things accessible are good for everybody, folks. Well, you know, it's yep. actually kind of funny. Um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the like simple tech that comes out through infomercials is actually technology that's been developed for people with disabilities. So, like, you see these um, these jar openers on late mm-hmm. night TV 
those were actually developed for people who don't have hands or who have difficult time with mm -hmm. using their hands to open things. So awesome. um, that's the kind of tech that does actually benefit anybody. Oh, and that's really cool. So that's kind of an example of accessible tech is actually for everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So we're kind of hitting the end of our time. And I do want to note that uh, I'm aware we did not address really invisible illnesses in this panel. Uh, this has mainly been focused on physical uh, disabilities that may or may not be more obvious. Uh, so, so please be, be advised both that and uh, how conventions can deal with gamers with disabilities are subjects that will be addressed in the future. Okay. Um, but since we're, we're at the end, do you guys have any final thoughts you'd like to share before I ask you to plug all of your social media? <laughs> <laughs> The, I, I, do, I do just want to say that even though, yes, this is a topic for another day, the yes. invisible disability thing is a big deal because a lot of times mm -hmm. you can't tell from just glancing at someone that they're deaf and so you approach them completely wrong. And mm -hmm. I'm not always wearing an eye patch. I was with Elsa this weekend and only wore the eye patch one day, but that doesn't mean I'm seeing fine on that side. I'm just mainly wearing it tonight to avoid irritation. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's a big topic that also needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important um, both for invisible disabilities and for, uh, uh, I guess, visible disabilities is that policing disabilities at the table isn't acceptable. Yeah. It's really important to remember that just when someone tells you they have a disability, questioning why or how or what isn't okay no matter whether they're mm -hmm. visibly or invisibly disabled. Um, and I see that a lot, uh, sort of happening at cons, but also just happening around tables sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely, it's, it's too big a topic to be included in another panel. Yes. Exactly. But did you have anything you wanted to add, Jacob? Um, no, not without going into the same detail. And there's, there's a like, like I said, there's a lot to be said. It's a very big topic, but um, it's definitely something that is worth being addressed. I totally agree. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's go around. Uh, um, Beth, if we want to find more about what you're working on and what you're doing, where can we find that information? Um, my website completely needs to be updated, so I'm not giving that out. Um, however, you can find me on Twitter under the handle of, of Real Comic Sutra. Um, and that's actually the main place at the moment because I'm spending more time working on the game than on promoting myself. I'm no bad marketing person. Um, but yeah, because I, I, I need to work on game and do day job. So yeah, uh, on Twitter, Real Comic Sutra and uh, Awesome Eights will be coming. I just don't have a date yet. Excellent. I will totally make a joke about cobblers, kids going barefoot. <laughs> yes. But I feel your pain. I it's feel true. it. I understand. It's, it's mm -hmm. hard to, it's really hard to find the time and resources to promote yourself. It's true. Mm -hmm. And Elsa, where can we find more from you? Um, you can find me at feministsonar.com. I'm at snarkbat on Twitter. And you can find me on Facebook, uh, I have a fan page, page, fan page that is Elsa S. Henry. Uh, you can find me at any one of those places, and you know, hopefully, I'll echo locate my way back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and Jacob, um, you can find me at um, accessiblegames.biz online. That's accessiblegames.biz um, on Google Plus, which is where I'm most active. I am plus Jacob Wood or plus Accessible Games Biz. And I'm at Accessible Games on Twitter, and you can find me somehow on Facebook at Accessible Games. I don't, I don't really use a lot of Facebook, so if you look me up there, you're, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I even tell you how to get to that. Honesty. <laughs> you can go to my website and click on the link if you want. <laughs> <laughs> the bane of Facebook. <laughs> Uh, well, I do want to thank you guys so much for uh, taking time, especially after convention, 
to uh, talk about this and for being such wonderful, wonderful panelists who indulged my every question, uh, even whenever I didn't entirely make sense. Uh, but I really appreciated your input, uh, and thank you so much for being on my panel. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we are going to go offline now, although we can stick around and talk for a few minutes. Uh, so let's say goodbye to the internet then. Bye. Bye, internet. Bye, internet. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs>